Hello, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to the Mount this afternoon um, and to our seminar. And I can't tell you um, just how amazing it is to see everyone here to talk about this wonderful area of uh, how to get all our kids to read and teaching all our kids to read. So it's amazing that you've all come here today. Um, I have uh, uh, the privilege and the honor to introduce to you this afternoon Dr. Joseph Torgerson. And um, of course, Dr. Torgerson is a world renowned scientist in the area of uh, reading development, reading disabilities, reading instruction and interventions, um, and in the area of learning disabilities more generally. Um, when I think uh, back on uh, Dr. Torgerson's career, I'm struck by the seminal papers that came out really in the late 80s and the early 90s, which really uh, laid out the field in terms of which phonological processes um, are reliable and valid, stable over time, which we hadn't known until that point, and, and then most importantly, which are causally related to reading and to reading disabilities. Um, through both basic and applied research, along with Dr. Torgerson's leadership at the Florida Reading Research Center, he has impacted the work of researchers, speech learning, um, sorry, speech language pathologists, school psychologists, education administrators, and teachers around the world. On a personal note, I first met Dr. Torgerson in San Francisco in, I believe it was about 1994. And as a newly minted assistant professor, I was standing quietly by a poster uh, that I was presenting with no one around me, and uh, Joe came up and engaged me in uh, a lengthy conversation about my work and about issues in the field, and there's not too much more that's kind of motivating and validating for a new assistant professor. <laughs> And I stand before you tonight a little bit older, <laughs> a little bit less naive, but with um, even more enthusiasm and respect for the leadership and the work of Dr. Joe Torgerson. So without further ado. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, uh, for that introduction. I appreciate that. I, it's good to be here in Halifax. Uh, I've never been to Halifax before, and I live in Florida, so I was uh, anticipating this would be kind of an adventure. And when I got here last night, about midnight, it was sleeting and uh, three degrees centigrade, and I thought, man, why did I leave Florida? This time of year, it's just gorgeous in Florida. I played golf uh, two days ago, and it was 80 degrees. But today, you have some Florida sunshine, right? So if this talk is boring or if it's unenlightening, just remember that I brought the sunshine, right? <laughs> um, I've been told that this is a mixed group uh, in terms of background. We have some school psychologists, some uh, reading uh, specialists, some reading teachers, perhaps a few principals here. Uh, did I mention school psychologists? Yeah, we have those. And uh, some university level people. And I'm sure there's some others. We even have a hypnotherapist over here. So he's right there if you have any problems you want addressed afterwards. <laughs> he's got the solution, right? So um, we're here to talk about uh, uh, this question, which is a, really an interesting question. Uh, you, we hear uh, about this idea all the time that we'd really like to do a better job teaching all of our students to be acceptably good readers by, uh, let's say, third grade or into fourth grade, into fifth grade, and so forth. And, and do we have any demonstrations? Do we know that that's even really possible? Of course, the answer to that question really depends on what do you mean by a good reader, doesn't it? And how do you measure it? And uh, when are you measuring it? Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm going to present a little uh, data uh, today and some, some, uh, an extended example from some real schools to uh, show that it is possible to come really quite close to that goal, uh, given a certain kind of measurement strategy. Uh, but also to illustrate the enormous changes we might need to make in the way we approach reading instruction, both in the classroom and at the school level. Because reading problems are a classroom problem and they are a school level problem. Uh, so uh, in my 
Well, let me just say that uh, to solve this problem in teaching all kids to read, we need to apply two different kinds of knowledge. This is really being over, a little oversimplifying, but uh, one of the kinds of knowledge we need to know a lot about is uh, about good pedagogy, right? Uh, 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 what are the best ways of teaching uh, different children to read? And we get this from research on the science of instruction. This is the area I spent the first 25 years of my career on. Um, and it asks questions like, uh, what is it that makes reading difficult for some children, so difficult for some children? Uh, and how might we best address the problems of those children for whom reading is extremely difficult from the very beginnings in kindergarten? Uh, it asks questions about, well, what are the critical skills that kids need to acquire uh, in kindergarten and first grade and second grade? And how do we sort of structure instruction to be sure that they're all included? And, and, and how do you manage all that? And how do you integrate it into a coherent instructional program? These are all questions about the science of instruction. And this is what we typically think of when we think of uh, getting knowledge to help us do a better job in teaching all kids to read. This is the kind of pro thing that's addressed with professional development for teachers. Um, uh, and <clears throat> so it's a big part of the uh, answer to the solution. And uh, in the last 25 years, we have made enormous progress. I mean, more progress than at any other time in the history of reading science has been made in the last 25 years. And right now, at this very moment, in 2013, we have a quite a surprisingly strong consensus among those who do research, okay? And that's an important qualification. Among those who do research and, uh, and, 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 and read the research in depth about these questions of what is it that causes some children to struggle so greatly in learning to read? How do children learn to read? What are the critical events or learning, uh, learnings they have to have along the way in order to become good readers? We know a lot about that, more than we've ever known before. This is a really rich time to be a reading teacher because we have so much good information that can help us be more effective with, with a, a wider range of children. So I spent the first 25 years of my career answering that question. And this, this other set of, uh, uh, of knowledge is uh, how do we implement what we know in a coherent way, in an effective way, within schools, within classrooms and within schools? Okay? This is the implementation problem. And in the last five to seven years of my career, um, I got really deeply immersed in this question as we tried to uh, improve reading outcomes in the state of Florida and in many other states around the United States. And uh, uh, there is less consensus, really, about how, how, we, how we do this, because we don't have as much systematic research on it, although we have, I think, quite an emerging consensus about the main things that need to be done. There'll be fine tweaking, depending upon local circumstances, but, and that's actually what I'm going to talk about most tonight. Those of you who came wanting to learn about phonemic awareness and phonics and the way we've integrated them and what the evidence is, I'm not going to talk about that at all tonight. Uh, but I am going to talk about what we know about effective classrooms and effective schools in teaching reading. And I've got a really terrific example to share with you uh, of a school district that actually did this. Uh, and so, of course, we have this knowledge, but then uh, that we have this enormous commitment because this is very difficult work. Uh, uh, a lot of people outside education don't realize how hard it was actually going to be to teach all kids to read. It's quite easy to teach many kids to read. There's actually very little direct instruction that some kids require. But other kids require an enormous amount of quite disciplined direct instruction for them to master uh, early reading and even into later reading and strategies and so forth like that. Um, um, so this is, the, uh, this is a statement that really begins the guts of my talk. And it comes from Richard Olson, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Colorado. We were talking in Los Angeles one time, and he said, you know, he said, for him, the central problem in reading instruction arises not from the absolute level of children's preparation for learning to read, but from the diversity in their levels of preparation. Um, if you think about the diversity among children's preparation for learning to read, you could, you could put it on an imaginary scale from one to 100. Some kids come to school, they've never even, maybe even seen a book in their home. They have no knowledge of letters. Their vocabulary is a half or a third the size of their 
of, of other people in their classroom, and so they're very poorly prepared for learning to read. And they'd be down at this end of the continuum. Other kids can already read when they come to school, right? And so they're very well prepared for going on and acquiring additional reading skills in first uh, and second, third grade, and so forth. <coughs> Typically, the diversity of our educational response doesn't cover that range. That's really why we have 30% of our kids not reading at grade level by third grade, because we aren't able to structure the, their instruction in a way that really meets their needs. And I don't think anybody who's here who works in schools would argue with that. That's almost a, almost a given. They're not learning to read because somehow we're not able to engineer the environment they need in order to uh, learn these fundamentally important skills in, lear in, in reading. Uh, in my view, I think in science tells us, as long as we're talking about reading, because kids are diverse from one another in lots of ways, right? They're tall and they're short and they're big and they're, they're thin and they're, and they're not so thin and they have different color hair and so forth, but there's at least three ways that they're different from one another that have an important impact on how well they learn to read when they come to school. One of those ways is in the broad level of their oral language ability. What's the size of the vocabulary? Uh, how much do they know about the world? Uh, how are they in their conceptual development? This has a particularly important impact a little later in elementary school, after third grade, when text becomes complex, the vocabulary starts diverging from oral language, and kids get lost in text because they don't have the vocabulary and the conceptual uh, power to, to understand it. But kids are very different from one another in this area when they come to school, aren't they? A second reason, the way they're different, and this has been one of the major discoveries of the last 20 years. They're different from one another in a specific area of language capacity that has to do with their uh, ability to uh, 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 understand the way the alphabet works in representing words in print. We call this their phonological language capacity, their ability to hear and manipulate the sounds in language, their ability to learn the sounds involved with letter names, and it is a language capacity. It's a component of their natural endowment for language, and kids are different from one another in this capacity, both because of their experience in, ho in the home and because of their genetic endowment. Okay? And that influences how well they pick up on those early, critically important skills in kindergarten, first, and second grade that lead them into being fluent and confident readers and accurate readers. In the third way, of course, everybody knows this, they're different in motivation and attitude and so forth, like that, that also has a really important impact on how well they learn from the classroom. All right. Uh, I'm just going to put some data up on the board really quickly. This comes from the United States. I apologize for that. It's also a couple years old. I apologize for that. I've been retired for three or four years, and so <laughs> that's my excuse. But uh, this uh, is an accurate, uh, this would be true in Canada just as true as it is in the United States, and it would, it's, it's just as true today as it was two years ago. Um, in the United States, every four years, they do something called a National Assessment of Educational Progress, in which they give a very large number of students a really, really good test of reading comprehension in fourth grade. And they also give it in eighth grade and then in, in high school. And uh, they, they have uh, categorized this test into different levels of performance, and if you perform uh, below the basic level of proficiency on this test, that means that essentially that any task that you're given in fourth grade that involves reading, you're probably going to really struggle with it because you're not, you're not as proficient enough to accomplish and do well on tasks that require a lot of reading. Okay, that's what that means, being below basic. And so uh, last time it was, well, this was in 2009, 33% of all fourth graders in the United States performed below the basic level. If somebody asks you how, much, how big is this problem of learning to read in, in the United States, you say, well, 33% of the kids in, in the fourth grade can't read at the basic level of proficiency on this really good test of reading comprehension. That's the best single estimate I know of, of the size of the reading problem. And my guess is it would be very, very similar in Canada from what I know about the, the comparisons. Now. That's true, but what's even uh, what's, uh, disconcerting is that, of course, there are big differences in this outcome depending upon your socioeconomic and uh, ethnic cultural background. So for white kids, uh, only 22% of them, well, that's still a big number, isn't it? 
but 22% of them perform below basic. But for African American students, it's 52%. Uh, and if you're Hispanic, it's 51%. And so we can call this sociocultural diversity. There's something in the backgrounds of uh, these children that makes it more difficult for them to learn to read in the standard educational environment. Another way to say it is, is we're not giving these students what they need in the first four grades of school to help them learn to read at the basic level, right? Our schools aren't organized in the right way. Our classrooms aren't organized in the right way. Perhaps we're not teaching in the right way for them to acquire the skills. We know it's possible because we've seen many schools do it, right? But nationally, we're not doing it. Um, if you just divide kids into those who are poor and those who are not poor, for, for poor children, it's 49% who perform below basic, and for the non-poor, it's 20%. Again, so this is a soci socioeconomic thing. Differences in, in home environment related to uh, preparation for learning to read. <clears throat> and then, and that's socioeconomic, and so then we also have students who have a disability and students who don't, and 65% uh, of the students who, who who have a learning disability or other kind of disability performed below the basic and non-disabled, it's 30%. Okay. Um, the only reason I show you these is just to dramatize something that everybody knows, right? Um, uh, some groups of students in our schools are quite successful in learning to read, and other students are chronically unsuccessful. And it's related to diversities. I'm telling you now, it's related to diversity in their home environment, and in their genetics, okay? And I'll talk more about the genetic thing here in a minute. Um, so uh, this is my favorite quote these days. It's been my favorite quote for about the last eight or nine years about reading. This is as true as uh, Einstein's equations. It's as true as any basic fundamental math fact. It's a logical uh, uh, truism, uh, but it's stated in a very nice way. When there is great diversity among students in their talent and preparation for learning to read, that's true here in Halifax, right? It's true in, uh, all across Nova Scotia. It's true in the United States. There's diversity in students' talent and preparation for learning to read. Little variation in teaching will always, you could say universally, uh, always result in great variation in student learning, okay? When there's lots of diversity and preparation and talent for learning to read, if we don't vary our teaching much across those children, we're going to guarantee that there will be great diversity in student learning outcomes. Okay. So uh, let's go into this example now. This is an example of a school district that took this problem very seriously. And they attacked it aggressively over a period of five or six years, and they had tremendous success in teaching all students to read. And I just want to tell you their story. So this was in Kennewick, Washington, uh, in the western part of the United States, and they did response to intervention before that name was invented. Those of some of you know what that means, and others don't, so we won't worry about that. But this is in southeastern Washington, has about 15,000 students in the district, 13 elementary, four middle, and three high schools. 25% of the students are ethnic minorities, and half the elementary students qualify for free and reduced price lunch, which means we would call them poor students, poor children, okay? It's not, that's, this is not a tremendously difficult population of kids, but it's substantially very diverse. So you've got, you've got half the kids that are, are poor, they come from that socioeconomic background in which there's not a lot of books in the home. Parents are uh, struggling to you know, survive economically. They don't have the same kind of preparation in their home environment that middle class and upper middle class kids do. <clears throat> um, so in 1995, the school board in Kennewick challenged the schools to have 95% of their students reading at grade level at the end of third grade within three years. <clears throat> they got together and they said, this is a reasonable challenge. Uh, let's do this. 90% of the students at grade level within three years. And they placed the primary responsibility for accomplishing this on the shoulders of the principal, the school principal which I believe is exactly where it should be, okay? Given some degrees of freedom in decision-making that the principals might have or had in this district. So uh, what was the reaction? Well, David Montague, who writes a lot in a certain book that reports this, 
he has a really interesting quote in the book. He said, uh, we thought the board and the superintendent were crazy. You know, he was one of the principals, right? He said, I saw in the white paper, the, the district had written this paper about this goal, that elementary principals were responsible and said, well, why don't they come down to our building and see the kids that come to our school? I mean, our kindergarten kids seem to enter school every year with lower skills. Have you ever heard that before? I have heard it a lot. How do you expect us to teach all these kids to read? They don't come to school well prepared. That's really what they're saying. They don't have the skill, they don't have, they don't come to school with the skills necessary for learning to read. How do you expect us to teach them? That's really what that says, right? All he's, what he's really saying is it's a big problem, it's a challenge. We have some kids coming to our school that might need four or five times as much reading instruction to read at grade level as other kids. So the district did a number of things at the district level. They passed a bond issue that provided a reading teacher for each school. This reading teacher was to help with supplemental instruction and be an example and so forth. And they began to hold public meetings at different elementary schools every two weeks. They also began training principals in what strong instruction looked like. They had made videos of what good instruction and reading looked like. They would bring the principals in, show them, talk with them about it and so forth. Uh, and they purchased a good computer-based assessment of reading that could be given at the beginning and end of the year to monitor progress. This was an excellent reading comprehension measure given on a computer, computer adaptive testing, and it provided very reliable scores uh, with some nice um, psychometrics associated with them of how the kids were doing in reading. Okay? And they had never had this before available to them, this kind of assessment. So after they began to do this, Montague says the whining began to die down and the goal started to grow legs. All right. So we began to have serious staff meetings we began looking at the test data to see how far behind some of our kids were. It was the first time Washington had ever had such precise data. In the fall of 1995, 23% of our third graders were reading at second grade level, and 41% of our third graders were reading at a kindergarten or first grade level. That surprised them. They hadn't had that kind of data before in that objective fashion. So um, what this chart shows is the school year. This is the school year over the next 10 years or so. And this is the percentage of kids who finished third grade reading at grade level on these computer-based assessments of reading comprehension. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to walk you through what happened over these years. Okay, so this is, this is the baseline year. This is the first year uh, in which they did this. They had 57% of their kids finish reading at grade level at the end of third grade. Okay, that's about... Uh, that's where a lot of schools are, in fact. Uh, this was ha happened in the next three years, and it was the result of a strategy that almost everybody would adopt if faced with this challenge. Well, let's work harder at third grade. You know, let's do a better job. Let's get our really good teachers in third grade. Let's really concentrate on reading in third grade and get these kids up to grade level. And so that's what they tried. That was the first thing these schools tried, and they saw a nice bump in the number of kids who were being successful, but it didn't change over the three years. They weren't, they weren't growing, they weren't increasing it. And I could ask you a rhetorical question, why do you suppose that is? Well, this is too big a group, we don't have a discussion group here, but of course the reason why that is, is because you have continually the same kinds of kids coming into third grade, and there's only so much you can do in third grade in terms of closing the gap with grade level reading skills. This is what he said, by the third year, we had exhausted our work harder at third grade strategy, right? More of the catch-up gain had to be made at second and first grade. Our first and second grade teachers realized that they had to become more accountable for their students' learning. Even our kindergarten teachers, who had spent most of their class time on social activities, began the transition to teaching phonemic awareness along with letter and sound recognition. This was back in 1995, okay? Um, so, uh, in this year, they began testing in second grade and focusing on earlier improvement in this year. And then in this year, they got a kind of a bump, result of improvement in both second and third grade. And then in this year, they began providing intensive interventions in the afternoon to many students. And also, at this time, they began working hard in first grade as well. They really decided that they have to do start, in, this has to be a kindergarten effort, a first grade effort, a second grade effort, if they're really going to meet this goal of all their kids. And so you can see what happened, uh, and this is almost unrealistic. Everybody is taking this test. Learning disabled kids, everybody in the school is taking this test. 
Uh, now, uh, you could ask the question, I certainly did, well, is there something funny about this test? Uh, it's the same test, and it's a, uh, well, I'll just tell you, it is a good measure of reading comprehension. But, so I, I went to the web and I looked up their results on the Washington State Assessment in fourth grade. And that's sort of a test that everybody in Washington State takes. And, uh, and uh, so they all take it in fourth grade. I wanted to see if the same kind of growth was happening on the Washington State test. And you can see the scores aren't quite as high in terms of grade level, but you see a very significant uh, increase. And up here in this point, again, it's up there in terms of very high numbers, with just a small percentage of kids still reading below grade level. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Boy, if a, if, a, if a school could do that here in Halifax, they would get a prize, probably, or at least be featured in the newspaper, or principal would be promoted, or something. People would tell stories, write songs about it, right? <laughs> it would be a legend. Well, this has uh, actually happened, and it's documented in a book that you can buy and read and, and see what they did. And, and, uh, uh, let me just quickly tell you about some of the things that they did in terms of the process of what they did. So, so this is, these were their kids, the school characteristics. And when I show you this teaching staff, those of you who are in elementary schools are going to say, whoa, that's really unrealistic. But what I'd like to impress upon you is uh, we have an example here of what it takes to do this. Right? I've never seen any examples this successful that haven't done something like this. Um, and so if this seems unrealistic to you in terms of the amount, amount of personnel, th this means that we have a social societal problem, a political problem on our hands, right? In other words, we need a different set of resources uh, to address this problem of diversity. So we have to get the governor involved and the provincial leader involved and all the way down and the legislators involved and so forth. It's more than just a classroom problem. Now, a principal can do something in many schools to help with this, and I'll talk about that. We'll, we'll show examples of that. But, so they had uh, two half-day kindergarten teachers. Kindergarten was only half-day, by the way, in, in Washington State. Three classroom teachers in each grade, one to five, had one district reading specialist, three Title I teachers. In the United States, if you have a certain percentage of poor children in your school, you get an extra supplement from the government uh, called Title I money, and you can use that however you want. This school was very smart. They invested in three extra teachers. Some schools use it to, I don't know, buy extra playground equipment or something like that, or write extra art classes. They, they decided to provide extra reading teachers, using their money for that. Uh, and they had one and a half uh, special education teachers and a PE teacher and a library and three specials. And they had nine paraprofessionals that they also paid for out of Title I who actually did teaching, okay, who were trained and had programs to use and, and did instruction. Uh, so how did they get an additional instructional power in the first grade? Well, during the morning reading block, there was a two-hour reading block. During the first hour, every child in the, in the school, in the first grade, got some kind of small group instruction. It wasn't the same kind, of course, because they had really different learning needs. So uh, they put 13 adults with 75 students during the first hour in first grade. Struggling students got one to three with the best teachers, with the most experienced teachers. Advanced students got one to seven with paraprofessionals. All right? They actually profit from a different kind of instruction, less teacher directive, more student initiated, and so they didn't need the same kind of instruction that those struggling readers needed. Um, in the afternoon, uh, many students get additional small group or one-on-one -on -one instruction as interventions in this school from these people. Um, in the second hour in first grade, it was whole group instruction, and during that second hour in the morning then, these, this group of additional support people would provide additional uh, intervention support in, in grades second through uh, five. And then in the afternoon, many of these also worked with, on special interventions. In the afternoon, many students were provided an additional 40 to 90 minutes of reading instruction. So some kids in the school were getting the two hour block in the morning, plus additional 90 minutes of reading instruction in the afternoon. That's kind of, that kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Uh, that's a big chunk of the school day. When you, so all they're saying is that reading is really critical. If we can't teach a child to read, uh, uh, we have essentially not done our job for them in the first three grades of elementary school. And I think they're right. 
So uh, there were four big elements in what they did. They did a lot of diagnostic testing. And this concept of proportional increases in instructional time. Uh, if you take away with you nothing else from my talk today, that's a concept that I hope really sinks in. And we're going to emphasize it in a minute. The further behind you are, it's a really simple idea. What? The more instruction you need, right? The best metric of that is reading, not process testing, not memory, not something else. It's how well do you read? How well do you have, what kind of mastery do you have of basic fundamental reading skills? Uh, decoding ability, reading fluency, uh, a vocabulary, reading comprehension, stuff like that. That's the best metric of that. Uh, teaching to the deficient subskills and then retesting to be sure the skill is learned. That's what they started to do in 1995. Uh, so let me just read a few quotes and you can read along with me, okay? By the fifth year, this is from Dave Montague, a principal of Washington who I showed you their data, the elementary school. By the fifth year, I was convinced that high performance reading was about more time and better use of that time. Students who were behind needed more direct instruction. Some of them started getting 60 to 90 minutes extra each day for a total of 180 to 210 minutes a day. We spent that time on the subskills they hadn't mastered. <clears throat> Principals and many teachers at these schools saw the direct connection between increasing instructional time and increasing reading growth. Students who were a little behind needed a little more instructional time. Students who were a lot behind needed a lot more time. That's almost a no-brainer, isn't it? It's almost common sense. It's something we absolutely do a very poor job of in, in almost all of our elementary schools. It's proportionally increasing instructional time based upon a reading level and how well kids are progressing. And there's a lot of constraints on this and there's some good reasons why we struggle with this. And so part of our big challenge is to find some solutions to those challenges. Growth is directly proportionate to the quality and the quantity of instructional time. When we looked at our data student by student, we saw a painful fact with painful clarity. Most students who start behind stay behind. And that's true in most schools. Time-starved reading programs that rely on sudden growth bursts from extraordinary instruction rarely move students from the fifth and the 30th percentiles up to grade level. And that's true, isn't it? I see a number of heads nodding, and yet we, we have a common experience there. Catch-up growth, I love this sentence, catch-up growth is driven primarily by proportional increases in direct instructional time. So any student who comes to school poorly prepared for reading has a catch-up problem, don't they? If we want them to be reading at grade level by the end of third grade, they have a lot of catching up to do. The best way to catch them up is by proportional increases in instructional time, assuming it's good, high-quality instruction. Catch-up growth is so difficult to achieve that it can be the product only of quality instruction in great quantity. That's a really hard fact. That's a hard fact for us to face, because most of the solutions we want to entertain don't involve increasing instructional time because it is expensive. It, it, there's a cost involved in doing that. This is why the primary and immediate strategy for catch-up growth is proportional increases in direct instructional time. Catch-up growth rarely occurs unless principals and teachers have good data, know each student's learning needs, and schedule proportional increases in direct instructional time. So if you want to read uh, this book, this is how you can order it. And I'm going to send a few extra copies uh, uh, to Jamie, and uh, it, she can pass them out to her friends. <laughs> or people that really need to, to see this, yeah. OK. Um, uh, this is in your handout, so you don't have to copy that down. Let me just show you what happened in another school I was involved with. And actually, we reported on this in a paper that's circulating around. I think there's some copies here, uh, if you're really interested in it. Uh, this was Hartsfield Elementary in Tallahassee, Florida. And they were a school with lots of uh, significant educational challenges. When I got involved with them, the principal came to me and said, you know, uh, we have this school that has been mostly a middle class school for the last uh, 10 years, but there's been real changes in demographics in Tallahassee. And now we're, now we're primarily a school that serves poor children, and we have a majority minority situation, and our teachers haven't adjusted. And our reading performance is terrible. 
And the reason he knew that is because Florida has mandated a third grade standardized assessment in reading called the FCAT, which is a good test of reading comprehension, and they had lots and lots and lots of their children performing at level one and level two on that, which is below grade level. So he was concerned about this, and he wanted to, to improve the situation. Um, and so uh, we began talking, and, uh, and we decided that the first thing that he needed to do, they needed to do was sort of alter the way they were teaching reading in grades K through three to be more consistent with modern research about effective ways to teach reading and about how kids learn to read. Uh, well, up to this time, teachers had been pretty much doing whatever they wanted to do in their classes. It was primarily sort of a holistic approach to teaching reading. Try to engage kids, give them interesting things to read, and most of them will teach themselves to read, or they'll learn to read kind of on their own. That works great for my children, and maybe your children, but it doesn't work so well for poor children, or kids who come to school with an impoverished language background, or experience with books. Um, and so uh, he cast about and found a good balanced reading program. He bought the program. He worked with his teachers. Some of them bought into it. Others, others of them left the school and went someplace else, and he hired new teachers. Okay? Some of them couldn't stand the thought of teaching more explicitly, more directly, some of the basic reading skills that we know are important in becoming a good reader. And so there was some turnover, not a lot, maybe 10%, 15% of the teachers decided they wanted to to, to not continue to teach there, and so they moved to a different school. Um, the first implementation the first year was not so good, just like most programs, it was sort of spotty, but they improved over the next two or three years and got better and better at implementing the elements of this comprehensive reading program that they brought into the school. Um, and then they began, uh, when they saw some gr growth and improvement, th they knew that they weren't doing well still with lots of kids. The, this, the reading program seemed to be addressing the needs of lots of kids, but it wasn't addressing the needs of some of the kids, maybe even 20% or 30% of the kids. Uh, they were having a hard time keeping up. So they began to screen in the fall of 1996 and gave more intensive small group instruction for at-risk students starting in first grade. Okay? So look, look, there's more to it than that, of course, but I'm just summarizing. So this is what happened, and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. In fact, we had not a, not a grant or anything, and he asked me to monitor the progress and see what was happening. So I said, well, let's just, let's just measure uh, their word reading ability at the end of first grade to start with, to see how we're doing. We knew from our own research that if you're below the 25th percentile in your word reading accuracy at the end of first grade, it's a very par poor prognosis for reading at grade level by the end of third grade. Okay? Almost uh, very few children who are below that level end up being grade level readers by the third grade. So that's our, let's use that as a simple metric. It was easy to give, only took a few minutes to give this test. We gave it to every student at the end of first grade. So when they began, in the first year of implementation of this new program, which remember was a spotty implementation, they had 32% of their kids reading below the 25th percentile, which actually, you know, given their demographics, wasn't all that bad, but uh, there were still 32% of the kids who were reading at this level that was, that was uh, not good from the standpoint of predicting their long-term growth. Uh, after a better implementation in the second year of the reading curriculum, they got that down to 20%. And then uh, it was at this point that they began to screen at the beginning of first grade and gave extra instruction to the kids who were in the bottom 30 to 40% on a simple measure of uh, reading ability. Reading ability, and the next year it was 11 percent, next year it was 6.5 percent, and in 1999 it was 3.5%. So it went from 32 percent down to 3.7 percent over a period of five years, uh, and so they ended up with very few children still struggling in this basic component of reading at the end of first grade. Now we haven't measured comprehension, anything all we've measured is word reading ability, right? Um, and their average percentile as a school went from the 49th percentile up to the 82nd percentile. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and they've continued to work with these kids in second grade, and we then measured them at the end of second grade just to be sure that, you know, it wasn't falling off and it was continuing to grow. And this is what happened at the end of second grade uh, over uh, some of these same years. By the end of the fifth year of implementation, the percentage of kids below the 25th percentile at the end of second grade was 2.5%. Okay? Now, I know that there's many of you who are asking this burning question. Well, what about reading comprehension? Did this have any impact at all on, on how they actually did on a real reading test, which is a measure of reading comprehension? And the answer to that is it had a big impact on how well they did on the FCAT, 
in third grade. So, uh, but it didn't solve the problem. Uh, the principal came away saying, well, we've got part of the problem solved, but there's additional things we have to do. He started a preschool in his school to try to address problems of vocabulary and so forth. But let me just show you. So uh, in, in uh, 2003, after the program had been going for a while, he had about 9% of his students, or 8% of his students, reading at level one on the FCAT, which is uh, uh, a level which can get you retained in Florida in third grade, okay? Uh, at, at the same time, the percentage of students at level one on the state average, which has fewer free and reduced lunch kids on the whole and fewer uh, minority kids, was 25%. So this work they were did in first and second grade had a huge impact on the number of kids who struggled at level one on the FCAT, okay? Uh, level two, which is still below grade level, they had 26% of their kids below grade level. In the state, it was about 40%, all right? Um, so uh, I guess what I would come away with is that uh, Hartsfield, we didn't have as complete a program. We were working with a more difficult population, and they didn't have an, as extreme a manipulation of instructional time either as the district out in Washington had. And yet, doing these few simple things, which I think really are within the reach of almost any elementary school, uh, they got a, a, a very significant impact on kids who were really in the danger zone on the FCAT. These kids are below grade level, but they can read grade level text with a little bit of struggle, and their prognosis isn't nearly as bad as these kids. So I'm going to tell you right now what I think are five points of maximum leverage. If you're a principal or you're a school psychologist moving into a school, or if you're a teacher who wants to uh, uh, change things, uh, no, nobody by themselves can, cha can change these things at a school level. It requires cooperation at many different levels within a school. But here's what I think after my experience looking at lots of effective schools, looking at school change, uh, are the five things that uh, almost all of these effective schools have done and seem to be the points of maximum leverage. That is getting, you do this and this will produce the maximum change. The first thing is, uh, and I know this is not something that's done in Nova Scotia, um, uh, but uh, I, I'm gonna say it anyway. So I'm retired, right? So I, you know, I have no consequence. <laughs> I already have my pension. <laughs> okay. Um, invest in a quality core reading program and provide sufficient support and training that teachers know how to use it effectively. So just here's the reason, the rationale for that. Um, there are some really good core reading programs out there now. There didn't used to be, but there are several different choices that you can make that are written by professionals that have a really well worked out scope and sequence, that have lots of good instructional language in them, and that if a teacher hasn't been trained to do these kinds of explicit instruction that we know are required for poor children and, and minority kids, kids who come to school less well prepared, if they haven't had that training, these programs can help them learn that about as quickly as anything I've seen. You can Im produce improvement with general professional development. You go out and you teach teachers about how to teach phonemic awareness and how to teach integrated in with phonics and, and how to do vocabulary at the same time and so forth. But it's, it is contained, the procedures for doing that are contained in some of these high quality core reading programs already. None of them are perfect. All of them are a bit weak in the area of vocabulary. But some of them are really quite powerful now in helping guiding teachers to a good scope and sequence and good instructional language for explicit systematic instruction that will have an impact. So that's what they did out in Kennewick, that's what Hartsfield did, that's what uh, mo most other effective schools I've seen have done. And they train their teachers really well on how to use this program. They don't just give it to them and say, here's, here's the manual, open it up and do your thing. They actually have people come in and model lessons and follow up and observe. So, and they insist on high fidelity. Not rigid high fidelity, but high quality, high fidelity implementation. Okay, so that's one thing. And if you're interested in this at all and wanna see uh, what we think, how you would choose a high quality core reading program, or how you'd train people to choose a high quality program, there's a document that you can download for free. Uh, and uh, the way you do that is you type Center on Instruction in Google, which is it's a national center in the US, and you go to the Center on Instruction website, and then you just, there's a search window, and you just type reading program in the search window. You come to that document, and you can download it. Okay, it's real easy. Um, 
The second thing is to help principals learn how to do effective classroom walkthroughs. Ray, Ray King was a former special education teacher. He was the principal at Hartsfield who did this, and he was out in his classrooms all the time, observing, giving feedback, encouragement, coaching his teachers. Uh, if you implement a high quality core reading program, one of the things a principal does is he, he or she walks around and, and they, they monitor, or they observe the implementation of that program. And they provide extra support, extra professional development where it's needed, or modeling lessons and so forth, so they're out in the classrooms a lot. And that's one of the ways a principal can be a real change agent in their school. Um, I've got a little video of a principal talking about this in her school. I just thought I'd play it for you. Whoops. First, there's another document, okay? If you want to download this one, this is uh, how you train teachers to do principals to do walkthroughs. You can download this from the same places as the other one. Here's the video of the, of the principal. We've heard the old adage, if you expect it, then you need to inspect it. And I have found that that to be very true here at my school. As we've put forth the, the, re the core reading program and the expectations that go along with it, as far as skills being taught, focus skills being put on blackboards each week, the centers reflecting what's on those skills. I find that as I walk through and the teachers know I'm coming, at the beginning it was kind of like, oh, I don't want to get caught. Now it's become just such a part of the culture that when I go through now, it's, it's part of who they are as a teacher and what they do in the classroom. But continuing to do the walkthroughs lets me see that that is going on and that teachers are planned, that they are taking it seriously, that they're focused on what we need to be focused on. It's also good as I go through, I'm able to see which teachers might need some assistance in their room. They may have one or two children that I observe maybe over at a center that need a little bit more help. Again, we can redirect paraprofessional help so that they can go in. Now, principals don't think that I have all this paraprofessional help out here. I have four and that four have to serve as my entire school and they have bus duty and they have morning duty and afternoon duty they go to the cafeteria and do cafeteria duty so we that's why we have to shift them so much to make sure that we're using them optimally we train them in specific programs so that they can work with children when they go into the rooms they do not grade papers they do not do bulletin boards they're working with children and helping children move instructionally Okay. Um. So the third point is to support, train, and insist that regular classroom teachers provide differentiated instruction in small groups for part of the reading instructional block. This is, the, uh, uh, this is all about providing high quality instruction to all the students, right? To be sure that we've got a good scope and sequence and you're covering what you need to cover. We begin to address the differentiation problem, this diversity problem, with small group instruction during part of the reading block. Part of the reading block is whole classroom instruction, and there's lots written about this. Some subjects lend themselves well to whole classroom instruction. Other topics do not lend themselves, like phonics. You have a huge difference in kids' needs, instructional needs in first grade in that area. Some kids need very little instruction in that area. Other kids need a ton of it uh, in order to master the, the fundamental skill that they need. And so how do we manage that? Well, this is not easy, right? Uh, but so this is the third point. Um, and uh, always in this small group time, you're going to have a classroom teacher leading one of the groups. Let's say she's leading a group of four students at this time. She might, during this hour of individual instruction, she might teach four different groups, each for 15 minutes, right? But the question that the principal observes and ask questions about during this time is, is small group instruction differentiated appropriately by student need? Or does the teacher teach four groups of kids and teach them all the same thing in the same way? All right? If that's the case, then they're not serving the purpose of differentiated instruction, right? Uh, what's the, uh, so, and the ways it can differ is some kids need a lot of this kind of instruction, other kids need very little, right? And so some of the groups ought to meet every week, uh, every day, for maybe 20 minutes, other groups can meet twice a week for 15 minutes to monitor assignments and so forth like that. Uh, size of the instructional group. Some groups can be seven kids, other groups should be no more than three or four. Uh, content and focus of the lesson. Uh, certainly, uh, I mean, uh, there's many kids by January of first grade have mastered 
the fundamental basic reading skills. They need to be really reading much more complex material. They need to be having rich discussions about text. Other kids are still struggling with letter sound knowledge. And so the content of these lessons needs to be different. And even the structure of the lesson, uh, and I don't have time to talk about that, but there are important ways that lessons can be structured differently for kids who have different levels of need. We've written a small brochure about this. If you're interested in this question, and then you can download this by going to the FCRR website and just type differentiated, differentiated into the search window. Just follow those directions, and you'll come to this document. You can download it for free. Okay. We also, on the same website, have some uh, teacher script language. So if you've got a group that needs more explicit instruction in uh, certain letter combinations or blending uh, uh, or uh, some aspects of phonemic awareness, you can go to this part of the website, teacher empowerment part, and uh, look at for instructional routines in many different areas. So for example, in kindergarten and first grade, we've got different routines for teaching phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary. The whole goal here is to help teachers use more explicit language, more explicit examples, so, because some teachers have never been taught really how to do this. And so uh, by using, and they're only like two page things and they can be generalized across an, um, uh, some different content. Uh, and that's how you get to that. Uh, and here's some examples of uh, different routines that are available. So getting back to this classroom during the small group instructional time, if the teacher is fortunate, if she's got a, re a principal who's really on the ball, he would have ed engineered the budget to provide her a paraprofessional or another reading teacher to be in her classroom during the small group instructional time, and that teacher will be leading another small group of kids. Okay? That's the way you maximize instructional power, is by having a real person work with these groups. And so we'll talk about how people do that. Uh, and then you're probably going to have some kids working in independent learning centers, because you don't have enough people to teach small group instruction to all kids at once, right? And so some of the kids are being working independently in student learning centers, and here's a little bit. And the question here to ask is, are these students working productively on appropriate practicing activities? Or are they preparing Halloween costumes or other kind of make work activity? This is tremendously difficult for a first grade teacher to come up with appropriately sequenced, appropriately targeted instructional independent practice activities that kids can do. So, uh, uh, and uh, so at our center, we developed a whole bunch of these that can be downloaded for free. Uh, and they have all the materials and the instructions for doing them uh, that might be needed. Uh, a reading center is a place where students practice, demonstrate, and extend learning independent of the teacher. To elaborate, reading centers, sometimes referred to as literacy centers, are special places organized in the classroom for students to work in small groups, pairs, at computers, cooperatively or individually. Each center contains meaningful, purposeful activities that are an extension and reinforcement of what has already been taught by the, the teacher, teacher in reading groups or in whole group. Let me just say that reading centers, independent reading centers, is not the best use of time for struggling readers. It can actually be the best use of time for more advanced readers, depending upon what the activity is. There's actually research data to show that. The kids who come to school well prepared in first grade and get off to a good start, they actually do better in terms of their growth if they have more time in student-directed activities that are focused on meaningful engagements with print. Kids who come into school weekly prepared do much better if they have more teacher-directed time focused on explicit uh, aspects of the language code and so forth. There's good documentation for that in, in several studies that were done in Florida and some other places. So anyway, uh, differentiation. Uh, and so this is the description. There's a whole bunch of these activities. They cover all the different reading skills, and uh, they're pretty easy to download. There's also a teacher resource there that helps provide training in their use. And also there's a, another document uh, that we prepared that actually talks about how you use these centers to, in an in a integrated reading program. And you can easily get this document from uh, following the instructions I have there on that page. Okay. Uh, this man right. So <clears throat> let me just set this up. Effectively differentiating reading by student needs is not easy 
and may seem a bit, at first, a bit like herding a group of cats. This man right here is my great-grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half-wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. So that'll help you to remember uh, the, the challenge uh, in this area. Um, the fourth uh, point, the principal and teachers need regular access to good data on student growth in reading, and district leaders need to pay attention to the data. Again, this is a truism. Uh, we need to know how our kids are doing so we can differentiate instruction appropriately, so we can move resources where they need to be, and so forth. And uh, I've written a very, uh, quite a short document that actually outlines how you set up and what the elements are of a good instructional uh, assessment program for kids in early elementary school. And again, you can download it for free. Okay. Um, and uh, the fifth one, and this is, gets back to wh where we started, right? Arrange the instructional schedule and provide resources so that students who are seriously behind can receive proportional increases in instructional time. Up here, the teacher can go a little ways towards doing this, but in most schools can't accomplish the whole task by herself in differentiated instruction during the reading block. There's simply not enough time. She doesn't have enough time of her own to do it. She needs help from the principal to accomplish this goal. Uh, and uh, there are three keys to developing and sustaining successful school level intervention. One is scheduling for success. You don't schedule around anything but reading uh, in elementary school schedule. That's what principals learn. Right? That's the most important thing. Arrange your schedule so that you can distribute resources across the day, use them efficiently, schedule everything around the reading blocks. Uh, budget for success. I'll, I'll play a, a principal talking about that and then teaching for success. Those are the three keys. And, and you can't do this with, with, if you leave one of those out, okay? Um, and we did restructure this. Let me just say that this is uh, one of the most effective principles I've ever known. He looks a little like he's been drinking too much the night before <laughs> on this video. This was a, a staff member who went down to his school and took this video, and I don't know what he, what, how they set it up, but just listen to what he says. <laughs> And we did restructure the school. We took a, a number of positions that had previously been uh, uh, non-student instruction positions and reall reallocated those positions into um, resource types of positions. Um, in previous schools I, where I haven't been in a Title I situation and those funds weren't available, it actually involved uh, redesignating some existing staff job duties to include uh, daily instruction uh, for students. That would be uh, five to six periods a day. In this instance, we were a Title I school and we did have the resources, so we spent a good deal of the summer looking at the number of students requiring interventions from our FCAT data and from our DIBBLES data that was available at the time. And then we determined from that exactly how many resource teachers we would need for the coming year and we structured the budget accordingly. Um, we, we did give up um, some uh, non-classroom positions, as I said, and turned them into reading resource positions. And this past year we had seven, uh, seven resource positions, um, all of which but one were paid for out of Title I dollars. So in his school, Many other schools were complaining that they didn't have any money for extra instructions. He was in the same boat, but he found money within his budget for seven additional su reading support people. So uh, if the principal has any flexibility at all in terms of how the budget is allocated, they can, uh, they can begin to look and see uh, uh, how they can provide more money for instructional support. Ways that instruction must be made more powerful for students at risk for reading difficulties. Well, most of you know these. More powerful instruction involves 
more instructional time, we've said that, and smaller instructional groups. Automatically, those are two basic principles for increasing instructional power. More instructional time and or smaller instructional groups, right? Assuming that the instruction itself is high quality, okay? And more it's more precisely targeted at the right level, clearer and more detailed explanations, more systematic instructional sequences, more extensive opportunities for guided practice, more opportunities for error correction and feedback. These are all characteristics of effective interventions, right? These two cost extra money, right? Or involve reallocation of resources within a school, all right? These involve professional development, right? And training and support. And maybe having good programs to help guide teachers in their instruction. Uh, who or what can contribute to more differentiated instruction and stronger interventions? Who can we use to provide extra instruction for kids? Well, there's a long list uh, in terms of what we've seen work effectively. The regular classroom teacher can do it. Special education teachers can do it. Reading resource teachers. Special area teachers, art, PE, and music. Some of the schools in, in Kennewick actually used the PE teacher to provide some small group instruction and reading. Uh, uh, OK. Uh, paraprofessionals and volunteers, if well-trained and provided with explicitly structured instructional materials, high quality individualized instruction and practice delivered via computers. This is an emerging area, and I would in, in, encourage any principal who's interested in this to really seriously look at introducing a computer-based practice and support as part of their intervention, overall intervention for increasing instructional time. There are some good quality programs to do that. And a good rule of thumb is the less experienced the teacher is, the more structured and scripted the intervention program should be. Just that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, so to summarize, uh, I've put all this stuff together in a document called uh, Teaching Students to Read in Elementary School, a Guide for Principals, which sort of outlines mostly what I've talked about in this talk with some additional examples and so forth. And again, it can be downloaded for free if you want uh, uh, from the website. And I'll just leave you with uh, a, a quote I like from the Kennewick School District. It matters little what else they learn in elementary school if they do not learn to read at grade level. Thank you. So I don't know how much time. I think it might have went a little bit over the time I was scheduled, but uh, do we have some time for questions? Anybody having a question about anything but FSU football? I don't want any questions about FSU football. Yes? Yeah. Oh, speech-language pathologists who are interested and have, have the right skills can be enormously important. Uh, it, it, for example, in training uh, uh, paraprofessionals or other interventionists in working in the area of phonemic awareness into phonics, things that are within their purview. I've seen uh, uh, speech-language pathologists used as part of the intervention team for kids with special, especially difficult language-related difficulties. Uh, in Florida, uh, speech-language pathologists are really, their time is really at a premium, you know. They have huge caseloads of kids who need specific language therapy, so it's been difficult in Florida to, to get them too involved uh, on a daily basis. But uh, some districts have used them for specific professional development purposes, and I've seen others where, where you had a, had a speech-language pathologist with a special interest actually lead instructional groups in reading. So, uh, I think uh, uh, that can be a changing role for speech and language pathologists, uh, 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 although it's very difficult given the range of language problems that speech and language pathologists. School psychologists, uh, 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 there is a, uh, although they, they're not the kind of people necessarily that we would involve in delivering instruction, again, their time is at a premium. It seems to me that uh, school psychologists, if they want to survive for the next century as a profession, really need to be thinking in more detailed ways about how they can support better differentiated instruction with formative assessments, that is, assessments to guide instruction. Instead of just giving an IQ test and a, other, something else for classification purposes, uh, thinking about how they can be part of the team that does ongoing evaluation and provide, may, helps make educational decisions, real educational decisions about kids in terms of who needs an extra hour and who, who doesn't. So uh, there's a whole area of expertise that involves with ongoing progress monitoring and screening that many school psychologists are not all that familiar with 
or at least haven't been. I think that's changing now in many programs. But uh, anyway, there's a question over here. Yes. I know we're talking, oh, sorry, um, numeracy. I'm just curious, what, do they go hand in hand with regard to, I know we're talking about reading here. The question is, is what is the, does it go hand in hand with reading? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> uh, well, actually, there is, there, there is uh, uh, some data th that I've seen that shows that districts that produce an impact, a big impact on reading, also see elevations in their uh, math outcomes uh, without any extra special targeted kind of interventions. Now, that may be just uh, that the kids do better on whatever math tests they're given, and they have more confidence and so, so forth. But I don't know much more than that about that. The, there's a huge issue out there, and I know that it's an issue for you. It's certainly an issue in Florida. It's an issue all over the United States, is the amount of time you have in the school day, all right? And uh, here I'm saying that some kids might need 210 minutes of reading instruction. That's a high proportion of the whole school day, right? Um, and so we have to do some hard thinking about this uh, in terms of uh, uh, what is the, what, here's something we know for sure. A child who uh, reads substantially below grade level in the third grade has very little chance of ever reading at grade level in most school systems. And is also much more likely to drop out of school before they graduate and is much more likely to have poor grades and not you know, uh, not take the kind of classes that will move them on up into a, in a better life preparation. We know that for sure. We don't know the effects of not having art and music. We just don't know. Um, uh, so I'm not going to say any more about that because I've made a lot of enemies uh, <laughs> uh, talking about that. But I just think it's time to, if we're serious about this goal of teaching the 30% to read well, or maybe teaching 90% of them to read well, then uh, we really have to change the way we work uh, it, to get more instructional time where it's most needed. And we have to then rethink also how we spend that time with the kids. Yes? Why hasn't this caught on? Oh, many, many reasons. And I'm sure you're running many of them through your minds right now. Well, how, where does the money, where's the money going to come from? You know, uh, 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 how is my principal rewarded? Is he rewarded for his school doing really well in reading, or is he rewarded for getting his reports in on time? I mean, there's lots of reasons why we don't uh, have really high-quality uh, programs like this implemented in our schools. One of the things is it's, it's really quite difficult. It's, it takes hard work, very disciplined work. The principal has to be engaged at almost every level. Uh, uh, the principal should know what good instruction looks like, has to be pretty decent at interpreting data, and has to be willing to confront teachers. And that's not a common skill, right? Uh, so one, one, Ray King, he, he likes to use a supplementary computer program at, uh, that, that every child who's behind spends 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day on. And it builds their skills and so forth. And he's got pretty good data from his, his own uh, experience that it, it's an effective thing to do. He monitors every week the number of minutes each children in his school spend on that computer program. And if there are some kids who are behind who are not spending the right amount of time on it, he goes and talks to the teacher and says, why isn't this? And then she says, well, I just can't schedule. And he says, well, let's move around this. Let's move this schedule around. Let's figure out a way to do this. So you've got somebody who's really uh, putting energy into that system. There's, uh, you know, uh, there are still uh, uh, differences of opinion about how we should teach reading. And uh, I'm not going to belittle. Uh, there are honorable reasons for having difference differences of opinion. I don't think they're scientifically defensible at this point uh, for thinking that we shouldn't do any explicit instruction in grades K to 3. We just know too much. Uh, uh, and not, we know that not every child needs very much explicit instruction. But we know that some children need a tremendous amount of it. Um, and again, I don't quite understand why it's taken so long to push back past, past that barrier. Um, but nevertheless, we have that. Uh, it, 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 it will be more expensive, I think. I, I, I just think, given the level of resources we have now in middle and elementary school, we can't expect them to do what Kennewick did. We have to provide enough, uh, enough flexibility to the principal so that he can actually hire some extra people. More instructional time, how do you get that? Well, 
you have to have more people involved in the instructional process. And so that might cost some extra money. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your talk. I appreciate it. Um, kind of a model that maybe we could strive towards and hopefully that will motivate mm -hmm. our province to really try to meet those wonderful goals that you laid out. Um, I'm just, I know this wasn't part of your talk, but I'd really like to hear your idea of what makes a high quality reading program. Um, okay. And I know you've done lots of research in that area mm -hmm. and I know that you could talk probably for hours on it, yeah. but if you could just give us some of the key components. Yeah. Well, I, so I actually haven't done a lot of research on this particular question. I've studied mostly interventions with kids, but uh, uh, I, I know a lot of people who've done a lot of research on that and so forth. And so, so uh, uh, a high quality reading program uh, its elements will vary, of course, with grade level, right? So in kindergarten, what should kids be learning in kindergarten? Uh, and what were the areas of difficulty for poorly prepared kids? Well, we know that poorly prepared kids, poor kids and minority kids, we're talking about right now mostly. And of course, we haven't even talked about dyslexic or reading disabled kids. They've got a biologically based problem in the phonological area. So they have, they have some similar problems. All right. So a good reading program will have uh, a sufficient amount of uh, explicit instruction in phonemic awareness and into letter knowledge and letter sound knowledge and will integrate those two in a way so that by the end of kindergarten a child is quite competent in uh, being able to sound out um, CVC words at least. Okay? Um, a good quality kindergarten program in reading will have a very powerful component of vocabulary instruction. A good quality instructional program in kindergarten will have um, lots of experiences that build oral language skills. Uh, listening to teachers read text, talking about text, uh, uh, challenges to their comprehension, and so forth, okay? It'll have those elements in it. But it's really pr critical that we not leave out the phonemic awareness and phonics part, which have been left out largely in many approaches, okay? All right. In first grade, um, uh, some of the children in the classroom will basically have mastered phonics and can decode almost any word you put in front of them. I've got a grandson, and I guess all my grandchildren are sort of like that. I was like that. You were probably like that, right? Okay, well. Uh, and so uh, you're, not gonna, you're gonna need some supplemental instruction maybe in blends and, multi, and, and it'll be multi-syllabic kind of work that you'll be, it'll still be phonics oriented, but it won't be at that basic level, right? But other kids are going to be in first grade and they're going to need letter sound instruction, even how to write the letters, right? So this is, first grade is a huge challenge. I, I really admire first grade teachers who can deal with the diversity issue well. I've got a sister-in-law in Tallahassee who does. She, uh, she brags all the time, I didn't leave any children behind this year. Every one of my children, you know, was at the 50th percentile. And, and she does it by devoting extraordinary amounts of time to her struggling readers and then giving lots of independent work to her stronger kids. You know, she really differentiates. So a good quality program, uh, but it won't have just these elements. They'll be integrated properly. And, and so when we talk about a scope and a sequence, uh, there are certain aspects of phonemic awareness that we can probably teach earlier on because they're a little easier and then we learn, move to more difficult aspects. And a good reading instruction will have already organize it that way, right? A teacher might not have the knowledge to do that. Uh, so in first grade again, and I actually sort of lay this out in that document for principals too. Uh, you'll, you'll, you have to have a phonics component. You, you have to have phonemic awareness also for your kids who are still struggling. Um, but again, that shouldn't be a very big part of instruction. Maybe in some of your small groups, uh, you'll have that. Kids continue to grow in phonemic awareness up through second grade, mostly in their ability to pick sounds out in more complex words. Um, and, and then you'll, you'll, you'll be moving into lots of uh, into fluency building opportunities, which uh, 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 the basic, we're talking about lots of reading, lots of reading of connected text for kids who can read. Let me just tell you an observation that I made in Florida. This just stimulated this. We asked our teachers in Florida to do lots of small group instruction during the reading block, and we got that. Uh, lots of small group instruction going. The only problem was, is, was all guided reading. Uh, they, they structured all of their in, intervention groups by what they knew, which was to have students sit around the group reading from a leveled text, and then when a student would make an error, they would correct it, or they would, they would talk about the meaning. And that works great for kids who are already well on their way 
in terms of fundamental skills. It's actually a really good approach because it gives them experience with text, talking about meaning, and occasional correction. But it doesn't work very well at all for kids who haven't got the basics mastered. They need a different kind of lesson. Um, again, so differentiation is the key. So you got to have good, good fluency work. Then comprehension becomes even more important with some beginning simple strategies for comprehension. Uh, uh, geez, and it's, what would I say? Uh, story elements? Uh, well, I forget. But there are a few. Actually, the the, the United States government, the the, the 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 clearinghouse for, has just published a document not too long ago that talks about good comprehension-oriented instruction in K3, and you can get that document from the What Works Clearinghouse, and they lay it out. And they they say that you focus on different strategies in first grade, second grade. It just makes common sense. But so anyway, you're starting to work with comprehension strategies, doing lots of reading and discussing. And writing, of course, done in the, in the right way. In second grade, uh, a good core reading program uh, will have some support activities in uh, uh, phonics. Uh, not, maybe not too much phonemic awareness at all, uh, I think. Uh, but uh, you're talking about m more complex kind of phonics skills, multisyllable words and so forth. Um, uh, but now you're moving heavily into fluency growth with uh, uh, even structured practice for kids who uh, fall behind, like repeated readings and things like this, and other kinds of interventions that get kids to read a lot. Turns out that reading something repeatedly actually has a kind of a unique benefit in that it exposes them in a fairly short period of time to a group of words they may not have acquired. We could talk for a whole hour about fluency, but we won't. Uh, and then comprehension. Uh, so that, uh, um, that's about as much as I want to say about that. Uh, Oh, uh, we have an alphabetic reading system, and it's not an easy one to figure out, right? Um, it, but there are some pieces of data that are just are critical to understand. So some people think that the way to teach kids to decipher a new word that they come to in text they've never seen before is to read the words around it, or read the sentence, and then guess what goes in the sentence. That's called using context, right? Or to use a picture, to, to, okay? The only problem with using context is that kids are wrong most of the time when they guess which word it is just from context. However, if they can do a little phonics analysis and have some of the sounds in their head, combine that with context, they're going to be right way more often. How do you learn words, how do you learn to recognize fluency by sight? You have to actually read them precisely, correctly, multiple times. So if you say sweater and you say jacket, meaning related, it doesn't help you uh, acquire sweater as a sight word. And good readers by the fifth grade have tens of thousands of words as sight words, right? They re that's how they read fluently. They don't have to stop and decode. And the way they got that way is that they read those words accurately. And Lene Airy would say, with some awareness of their phonological structure as an aid to forming the orthographic image, the image of the word, uh, and thus they're fluent readers, right? And so it, th those are foundational skills. And we, we, see, we know that that's important not only because of some instructional studies that have shown that those kinds of instructional approaches work, works well, but we also know it from the, our basic understanding of how kids learn to read and, and what tr transitions a kid from being a non-reader in kindergarten into a fluent reader by the end of first grade or end of second grade. So uh, phonemic awareness, and phonics particularly, using that actively as you read as a way of dealing with words you've never seen before in print is critical. Uh, to becoming a fluent reader in fourth grade. And it's unfortunate that kids with not, with, who don't have good text background and who are maybe some, have some weaknesses in the phonemic awareness area, again, because of their language experiences in the home, uh, have a really hard time figuring that out on their own. Why not just give them some good direct instruction to help them uh, get it easier, as long as we don't go overboard, you know? No need to go overboard and do the same thing with every child. We've spent a whole hour talking about that here. But there are some children who really need a good dose of that. Yeah. Um, hi. I have two questions. First is, I know you're here. We'll see if we like your first one. And then okay. we'll okay. <laughs> the first is, I know you're here for a couple of days. Is there any slight chance that you're meeting with anyone from the Department of Education while you're here? Or? Yeah, actually, uh, we're going to meet with a few people. Oh. But uh, <laughs> Jamie Metzala and others here at the university are working very hard on this issue. 
uh, and I know yeah, other people are working uh, yeah. around, yeah, trying to, trying to bring some of these ideas into practice. That's good, that's encouraging. Yes. Um, so, um, as you know, like our system here is very different from that in the States, and the Department of Education has control over, I mean, all of those wonderful things that get implemented that your principals have control over, and boards even have control yeah. over, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, so, not only does it make it challenging for the individual boards who want to make changes, or the individual schools, but for the professionals who are in the classroom, I myself am a school psychologist. Yeah. So, when you don't have the support from the top, mm -hmm. who, even though we know what research says and what we mm -hmm. should be doing, is not being done, mm -hmm. um, how can the, you know, the ground up, bottom people um, provide support when they don't have all of these great? Boy, you know, I don't know how many times I've been asked that question. <laughs> and I always say, uh, here's, the, here's my sock answer. Uh, so you, um, you have to think carefully about your situation, who the people are and where they are. Uh, and then you have to think about, well, how do you uh, uh, change people's opinions about things? And of course, we know that that's not an easy thing to do. You have to try to understand what is motivating the commissioner of education. Is he judged in this province by how well kids are doing in reading, or is he judged in some other way? Uh, well, people tend to be, uh, and so, and, and you can write letters, you can write letters, op-ed pieces, you can uh, put stuff in the newspaper, you can uh, sponsor, uh, I, I, these are all things I've seen people do, right? You can sponsor meetings where you bring outside speakers in, uh, or uh, uh, um, you can uh, uh, slyly give uh, pieces to read to your favorite teacher. You know, develop some relationships with teachers where they trust you and your knowledge, then give them something to read. You know? um, uh, so the answer to that question depends on who you are and where you are in the system and how much knowledge you have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so you can start influencing your friends. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. You wanna take this? In the second one. Well, scholar and technician, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Torgerson, for um, that wonderfully thought provoking um, talk to us tonight. And I just want to say, if you didn't get quite enough of Dr. Torgerson tonight, um, he is presenting at the Emergent Learning Conference tomorrow, and that talk is uh, totally different. It will be on uh, reading disabilities and the core difficulties, as well as um, successful interventions. And if you're not registered for the conference, there is a, a $20 fee for a single session admission. So 11 o'clock at the World Trade Center. Or not Halifax Trade Center. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, um, we are. We do have some coffee and tea and treats. So I hope that you'll stay and talk to each other and uh, perhaps meet Dr. Torgerson in person. And thank you all for coming out and and let's keep um, addressing this issue together. Uh, it's very encouraging to see you all here tonight. Thank you.